Buenas tardes, eh, nos complace muchísimo poder compartir esta eh, séptima edición de Confluir con Ríos. Eh, pronto llegaremos al final de la serie que será el martes de la semana que viene, pero recordarles que esta es una iniciativa compartida entre Enlace Arquitectura y Ciudad Laboratorio, y también conjuntamente con la Facultad de Arquitectura y Urbanismo de la Universidad Central de Venezuela y el Departamento de Arquitectura de la Universidad Simón Bolívar. Este, para la presentación de nuestros eh, panelistas del día de hoy, que son Ernest Wong y Joana Saidán de SITE en Chicago, voy a ceder la palabra a Alejandro Castro y a María Valentina Guerrero para que continúen con la introducción. Uh, hola, tenemos el gusto de invitarlos a la séptima charla del ciclo Confir con Ríos, presentada por Ernest Wong y Jonas Aiden de Site, titulada Reframing the Chicago River, sobre el río Chicago en Chicago, Estados Unidos. Eh, nuestros ponentes son Ernesto Wong, fundador y director de Site, quien ha sido fundamental en la evolución vanguardista y multicultural de esta firma de arquitectura del paisaje en Chicago. Estando al frente de la gerencia de la empresa durante más de 31 años, SITE ha ganado una reputación por sus diseños creativos y el desarrollo de espacios urbanos orientados hacia la comunidad. Un firme defensor del compromiso cívico y comunitario, el señor Wong forma parte de la Junta de numerosas organizaciones de servicios y jurados profesionales, incluyen, incluido el premio Driehaus a la excelencia arquitectónica del diseño comunitario, la Liga de Servicios Chinoamericana, la Junta de Planificación del Near South y como presidente de la Comisión de Monumentos Históricos de Chicago. Además, el señor Wong es un frecuente ponente en universidades, así como en conferencias de diseño y diversidad. Joana Saidán es gerente de proyectos en SAI y forma parte del programa de diseño sustentable y paisaje urbano del Departamento de Transporte de Chicago. Nacida y criada en Sao Paulo, Brasil, estudió el pregrado en arquitectura y urbanismo en la Universidad Mackenzie en Sao Paulo y se mudó a Chicago en 2014 para realizar una maestría en desarrollo urbano sostenible en la Universidad de Paul. Tiene un historial educativo y laboral multidisciplinario con experiencia diversa que incluye ser socio gerente de una firma boutique de diseño de paisaje en Sao Paulo y directora de zonificación y desarrollo urbano para un concejal de Chicago. Uh, with no further ado, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you. Hola, buenos días y bienvenidos. Uh, ¿Puedo compartir mi pantalla? Sí. Celito, no sé si nos van a cobrar, o sea, la comisión es Eduardo había conseguido una manera Bueno, um, yo me llamo Joana y voy a presentar la introducción de esta charla sobre el Chicago. Pero a partir de ahora, perdóname que voy a continuar en inglés. Uh, first, I want to introduce you uh, again. <laughs> Alejandro already started it, but I want to introduce you uh, formally to Ernie, um, uh, who will deliver the main part of the lecture today. Ernie is the founder and principal of SITE, and of course played an essential role in converting the firm into, into um, multicultural cutting edge design entity and fostering the landscape architecture profession in Chicago. Site Design Group was founded in 1990 and is a award-winning landscape architecture, urban design and architecture firm based in Chicago. Site has established a reputation of creating creative design and developing thoughtful community oriented urban spaces and improving the quality of life in urban neighborhoods. We are a team of 36 professionals from all over the world, and diversity is a core aspect of who we are as a firm. Not only SITE was founded by children of immigrants, we believe diversity is an asset and that good ideas come from different places. We provide design services to architects, engineers, municipalities, corporations, and institutions throughout Chicago, the United States, and Asia. Each project is designed with social responsibility, sustainable accountability, and land stewardship in mind. Now, before Ernie talks to you about some selected projects along the Chicago River, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of the river. 
Jean-Baptiste Juan de Sable was the first permanent resident of Chicago. He built a farm on the northern bank of the river in the 1780s. In 1795, an Indian confederation granted the United States a parcel of land at the mouth of the Chicago River. In 1803, Fort Dearborn was constructed on the south bank opposite to what had been DuSable's settlement, where today is Michigan Avenue Bridge, that's the core of downtown. At the time when where, uh, Europeans arrived, the Chicago River flowed slowly into Lake Michigan from Chicago's flat plain. And as the city grew, sewage and other pollutions were uh, discharged into the river. The Chicago River was known by many local residents as the stinking river at the time because of the massive amounts of sewage and pollution that poured into the river from Chicago's booming industrial economy. The South Fork of the main branch was the primary sewer for the Union stockyards and the meatpacking industry. At the time, it was so polluted that gases were bubbling out of the riverbed from the decomposition of blood and other animal waste, and it became known as Bubbly Creek. Sewage from the city was dumped into the Chicago River and flowed into Lake Michigan, which until today is the clean water source for the city. With fears that the sewage could reach the water supply intake and cause serious disease outbreaks, in 1887, the city decided to dam the river and reverse its flow, sending all the wastewater away from the lake where it could be treated before emptying it into the Plains River. The complete reversal of the river's flow was accomplished in 1900 when the sanitary and ship canal was opened. It's a 28 mile, which is 45 kilometers, um, canal system connecting the south branch of the Chicago River and the Des Plaines River. Besides being a sewage treatment scheme, the construction of the new canal also allowed much larger ships to navigate between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi River. Despite the reversal of the Chicago River and even the construction of the largest wastewater treatment plant in the world at the time, contaminants continued to accumulate in the rivers, canals, and Lake Michigan. The continuing problem was due mainly to the fact that Chicago and many of the older suburbs were served by combined sewers, where both sanitary and rain, rainstorm water flowed through the same pipes. As the area developed and more land was paved, the amount of rainwater entering the sewer system instead of draining into the soil dramatically increased. During large storms, the river was forced to reverse to the natural direction, releasing raw sewage into the lake. The area waterways were polluted and beach closings were frequent along Michigan shoreline. In addition, combined sewage would back up into basements of homes and businesses. The Tunnel and Reservoir Plan, also known as Deep Tunnel, is a system of four deep tunnels that capture and convey combined sewage and stormwater to three reservoirs. It's designed to protect Lake Michigan, which is the region's drinking water supply from raw sewage pollution. By capturing and storing combined stormwater and sewage that would otherwise overflow into waterways in rainy weather. The stored water is pumped from the system to water reclamation plants to the clean uh, before being released in waterways, improving water quality in Chicago area rivers and streets. Uh, construction of phase one began in 1975. Uh, it started operating in 1985 as some of the tunnels were built. The tunnels portion was, uh, which was phase one, uh, was only fully completed in 2006. And the reservoir portion, which was phase two, is currently mainly complete, but there is an expansion of one of the reservoirs expected to be finished uh, only in 2029. Until the 1980s, Chicago River was still very dirty and often filled with garbage. Since then, several initiatives from government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and other activists have been working for several years to clean the Chicago River. Since 1979, Friends of the Chicago River has been working to improve the health of the river system for the benefit of people and wildlife. In the 1990s, the Chicago mayor, um, Richard Daly, promoted extensive cleaning as part of a beautification effort. In 2004, Friends of the Chicago River, the City of Chicago, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and other partners launched the Bubble Creek Re Recovery Initiative to lay the foundation for an ecosystem restoration plan. Another program aims to increase wildlife habitat on the North Branch using floating plant islands. The program is managed by the nonprofit conservation group, Urban Rivers, with assistance from the Shed Aquarium. Between 2013 and 2016, the Chicago Park District opened four boathouses, two on the South Branch and two on the North Branch. 
Nowadays, the dramatic improvements in the water quality of the region's waterways have allowed fish and wildlife to return. Marinas and riverside restaurants proliferate, river recreation and tourism are booming, and waterfront real estate values have skyrocketed in Chicago area residents see the river as a major asset rather than an embarrassment. Now I'll pass on to Ernie, who will present selected projects along the Chicago River. Muchas gracias, Joanna. When this started, um, it is such an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, projects that our firm, Site Design Group, has done along the Chicago River over the past 20, 25 years or so. Um, as Joanna had explained, the, the river has really uh, taken on a new identity uh, for the city of Chicago. But it used to be a very uh, detrimental and uh, raw sewage canal is now an activity area for recreation, and um, but is still actually very active in terms of its uh, use as an industrial uh, transportation uh, area. So that uh, barges continue to flow up and down the Chicago River, carrying supplies and everything. Uh, but now they have to maneuver between uh, the kayaks and, uh, and, and recreational boats. So let's go to the first project, please. So uh, you saw the earlier slide of Pingtown Memorial Park, uh, which was a project that we had been working on for uh, well over 20 years. Uh, it started out as just a small uh, section south of the 18th Street Bridge um, of a seven acre site, uh, linear site along the Chicago River. Uh, this is really uh, uh, a, an interesting project because this was formulated with the, uh, the Chinatown community within Chicago. And the Chinatown community had gone without any green space within their community for over 35 years. Their, uh, the green space had been taken away when the highways started to uh, form and uh, took away their only park. And so for 35 years, they did not have a park. Uh, and this new site was uh, developed, uh, as you can see, uh, with not only with the straightening of the Chicago River, uh, but also this new land that was kind of uh, formed. Next slide, please. Um, so now the, uh, over the last 20 years, the park has really grown. Um, one of the things that's very difficult is people don't know how to get there, which is very interesting. It's in the middle of a very active neighborhood, uh, but um, you have to go through a residential neighborhood in order to get to the park. But once you get to the park, it's completely, it's very spectacular. It is one of the most uh, sought after destinations uh, within the city of Chicago, within the neighborhoods also. And uh, during the dragon boat races, which you saw earlier, um, uh, brings tourists from all over the place to participate in those wonderful races. It has now become a destination uh, of, of beauty. And uh, even though the, the, the train tracks are very active around there, it is still such a spectacular site of the uh, city of Chicago from that location. There's been new developments along uh, this park, uh, another eight acres uh, has been added to it to the north of 18th Street, as well as another six acres for ball fields and a field house across the railroad tracks. It still has some issues. Uh, there's a separation from one portion of the park to the other uh, because of the railroad tracks, but we continue to work on this project and, and hope that at some point it can be unified as a single uh, park space for the city of Chicago. Next, please. Um, Joanna had talked about the stockyards uh, and the importance of uh, that economy for the city of Chicago uh, during the early 1800s, uh, the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, the stockyards and the meatpacking industry was so profuse uh, in the city of Chicago 
that they had to figure out what they were going to do with all of these carcasses. And they ended up putting them in this area called Bubbly Creek. Uh, so they, this man is now standing on top of all of these decomposing carcasses uh, of, of animals, dead animals. And um, it continues to be a situation in um, uh, at this area, but now real estate has started to grow around that area. So now there's this desire to clean up this, uh, this waterway. The problem here is that the water is, uh, the water level is very shallow. Uh, and so the Army Corps of Engineers and several engineering firms have really looked at how do we start to clean this up? You could start to dredge it, and, but you would end up stirring up a lot of this, this old material and the pollution that that would occur and the problems that that would occur with environmental issues uh, was too great. Uh, so they continue to start to look at uh, ways to aerate that and, and continue to clean that section of the river. These are now uh, starting to become uh, million dollar homes along that area. And so there's a great desire to clean up that part, portion of the river. Uh, we developed these er series of boardwalks um, and ways to actually access the river. Uh, right now, you have, um, when you get to the top of the river, it's about 10 to 15 feet above the water line. So it's very difficult to, uh, to access that. But the more people that get brought to the river's edge, the more people start to look at this river as an asset rather than a uh, detriment to their neighborhood. Next slide. We're doing this throughout the entire uh, city. Um, this is uh, uh, the start of a new development of an industrial area uh, north of the north branch of the city. Um, and uh, so this was the start, uh, the first building that was done uh, alongside of the river. And it started to look at how do we start to treat that edge. You can see how, how high the, the land is above the water level. And so, you know, this is a difficult situation. We continue to see this, especially along the North Branch. And you'll see as we get further along, some of the design guidelines that we've put in place now for this portion of the city uh, to try to get people further down to the river, to the water. So it's become an area that nobody knows how to get to the river. Nobody knows how, you know, what that looks like. So in this particular project, one of the things we tried to do was uh, to really uh, enhance the landscape. So it's a much more beautiful landscape, uh, but also start to attract wildlife and other, uh, and bring it back to nature. Uh, this is a heavily industrial area that has been, uh, you know, utilized as a as a dumping ground for so many years, and so this began the idea of creating these set of guidelines for the entire area, in order to develop um, spots along the Chicago River, on uh, both sides, in order to start to uh, engage more and more people to the river. What this does is this starts to create a better uh, uh, environment for both wildlife as well as uh, birds and fish. Uh, one of the things that we tried to do here was to start to uh, look at the plant material and how we were going to start to utilize that in a way that starts to naturalize these edges a little bit more. So it does two things. One, one of them is that it, it brings people further down towards the river edge, but it also gives us opportunity to have a much more uh, natural landscape along there while cleaning up the river at the same time. Uh, this has been, this is our initial rendering uh, for this area. They have started to develop this as uh, shown and it is now called the Wild Mile, and it is now uh, nearly complete uh, this year. So we're very excited about that. 
This is another project uh, that we took on uh, for a private developer who had bought a building alongside the North Branch of the Chicago River. Uh, one of the things he wanted to do was to try to figure out how to uh, get a restaurant on a barge uh, and dock it onto the uh, edge of the river where his building was. And so we went ahead and we started to look at ways to do that and access down to the river again in a different, uh, more natural formation of stone and landscape. Um, this was never realized. It was very fictitious. He never got his permit to do this. Uh, but we looked at this as an opportunity for other ways to activate the river as well. This activation of the river, I think, is really important because it starts to uh, get people more and more uh, uh, acclimated to uh, the importance of this waterway. And uh, now they start to take more ownership and they start to continue to clean it. So one of the, the things that the city did uh, uh, about four years ago was they asked a number of very, very, uh, probably some of the top architecture and landscape architecture firms throughout the country to uh, do a competition to start to look at the Chicago River uh, in, in a way that is very visionary. So they had asked Skidmore Owens and Merrill and uh, Perkins and Will and David Ajay out of London and uh, SWA uh, Sasaki. Uh, and we were one of the only local landscape architects that had started to do this. So this actually is an idea of uh, really about the graphics. And as, um, as we had figured out that all of these big firms we're going to go and uh, do these photorealistic renderings of the site. We decided to take a much different approach um, of looking at this in a much more uh, almost animated uh, um, uh, approach so that we started to look at this in a very uh, graphic, uh, much more graphic uh, and entertaining uh, approach to looking at how we can start to engage with the river. So the part of this is the separation of uh, these trails of uh, along the river, of one of them being, if you use it for speed to get from one destination point to another destination point, or whether you're using it for a very leisurely walk, we wanted to separate those two uh, ways of traveling along the river but all along the way have different points of which people can start to engage with different activities. So this was our idea of it. And um, it was very different than any other submission uh, to this. And people were very, uh, the, the, the words, you know, the things that people were saying about this were like, what well, were they thinking? This is really, this is pretty wild. But we were really happy that it really stood apart from a lot of the other uh, firms that had done their work. Um, and so we, we got really excited about it. And you'll see in a, a little bit of how this started to transform itself into uh, some reality. And so we're starting to get there, but uh, this was really kind of an idea of how do we graphically show this in a much more interesting way. So part of the exercise was to develop this so that it was, you know, now in architecture and landscape architecture, we're getting to the point where animation is really a part of our work now, right? And so we started to look at how, how do we start to do that? This is the mayor of Chicago looking through these eyeglasses onto uh, the app on the phone uh, and seeing how this is going to transform itself. And we'll show you that, that video.
in, in this particular area, um, it, when, uh, if you could go back, Joan, just one, one bit, you can let it loop. Um, but you can see the existing condition along this building, which was very sheer all the way down to the river's edge. And so one of the things that we were really trying to do was how do you add on to that in order to get that, um, uh, uh, in order to get that um, uh, trail to bypass that. Uh, so these are, they can get very expensive. Uh, uh, it is much for visionary than anything else. But we also felt that this is uh, a way to kind of um, navigate through some very difficult parts of uh, the Chicago River and its downtown buildings. Okay, we can move on. So what this led to was a series of uh, design guidelines for the Chicago River. As I've said, now uh, they have now instituted, the city has now instituted some guidelines to say that um, any developer that comes into the city uh, or even the municipality, when they start to do work alongside of the river, there is a, um, uh, a maximum or a minimum of 35 feet from the river's edge that they have to dedicate towards the public use. And not only that, but there are ways to treat that edge in order to, to uh, get people further towards the water's edge, as well as separate those pedestrian and bicycling uses. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities here and we continue to, to look at uh, how that's going to evolve over the next few years. Next. You can start to see some of the thoughts that we have, some of the tougher areas, uh, particularly in the urban areas, uh, downtown buildings that are directly against the river, uh, how we have to start to build out onto the river. But there's also this challenge of moving underneath the bridges, which is very expensive to do. And so we started to look at that as well. Um, but really to you know, engage with more people in the pedestrian area uh, in order to get to the, uh, to the river. And you can start to see how we started to look at that and how some of this might be floating. Some of this might be uh, stabilized onto the riverbank, uh, but uh, there are ways to do it. And we continue to look at different ways of uh, moving that forward. The object of it is really to, be, uh, to, to get a continuous river walk uh, from the downtown area uh, all the way south to Pingtown Park, uh, which has never been done. Uh, we hope that over the next 20 years that that will be able to happen and that will become not only a mode of transportation for people who uh, will use the river also, you know, as there ways to get uh, back and forth from downtown and into the neighborhoods, but also uh, uh, recreational and an active way to start to look at the river. This is uh, an example of a building that we just uh, completed, uh, a massive building um, uh, within Chicago that was repurposed and now it is the home of Chicago's Uber and uh, Walgreens and a number of other uh, corporations have their headquarters here. Uh, but this is a, a, another treatment on how do you get people down to the river's edge. Next. So this has become a challenge, but also an opportunity for the city of Chicago. So one of our competitors, Sasaki and uh, Carol Ross Barney had provided this, uh, uh, this river walk, uh, which was the start of really getting activation at the river's edge. And it became so successful over two years, it brought in millions and millions of dollars in revenue, uh, not only to the city, but also uh, and just people continue to flock there. So when you start to look at destination points for tourists, this really became one of those places. But you can also start to see how thin and narrow this walkway is. So if you go to the next slide, the opportunity really became, how do you start to 
enlarge it so more people can get there and more people can continue to use utilize this river edge. So what the city did was they asked us to uh, continue on with this river walk, but in a different way. Next slide. And so what we came up with a, uh, the section from uh, Michigan Avenue to Lakeshore Drive, about probably about half a mile of, uh, of walkway and um, really started to look at it more of a, as a park. And so we started to look at different ways for people to, um, to walk along the river and uh, play along the river. So you'll see these different areas that really become a lot more active and a lot different and a sense of discovery of the Chicago River and the landscape itself. Different ways for people to sit and activate, uh, different ways for people to utilize this space and in all different methods. And so it, this has really been a huge success for the city. It continues to be a place where people get to meet and romance. <laughs> so it has really become a wonderful place for the city. So Kingsbury Park, I showed you that uh, the uh, example of that first building in that industrial area. So that whole area now has become uh, a, a mixed use um, uh, development site for both, it used to be industrial, now it's becoming much more commercial and residential. And so there has been uh, a push from the neighborhoods to create more active recreation along the river and more uh, play spaces. So that was the, what you saw earlier was an earlier sketch of what uh, one of those sites could be. And now this is being developed uh, now uh, and, and really becoming an active place along the Chicago River. And one of the things this does is starts to separate also these active uses from the river walk itself. But it becomes, you know, an entire kind of comprehensive area for people to populate and for people to go. And so it's not only just the buildings and the development along the, uh, along the, uh, uh, um, along the river, but it also becomes a area uh, of open space as well. So with that, Joanna, I think you have the next set of slides. Yes, um, thank you, Bernie. Uh, so Bernie and I thought that you might be uh, also finding interesting to learn about the project in Latin America, where the existing conditions and challenges may be more similar to those found in Caracas and uh, Rio Guayre. Um, as Elisa was saying, I'm from Brazil and my hometown, uh, Sao Paulo, there is also a river system crossing the urban area. Uh, what you can see in this aerial map on the left are the two main rivers that cross the city. The Pinedos River, uh, it's right through the middle in a north-south direction, and on the north side, uh, the Tite River running east-west. Both rivers are still polluted despite cleanup efforts that started about 30 years ago. Uh, unlike in Chicago, uh, the rivers were relatively clean until the 1970s. Uh, the city's metro area population in the 70s was about 8 million people, and in 20 years, it almost doubled. Today, it's more than 22 million. This rapid growth is one of the main factors that led to the pollution of the city rivers, um, because informal constructions were built uh, without proper sewer connection on lands next to streams that flow into the rivers and their basins. And I, from what I've seen on uh, your website and the project that you were doing, it seems like this is very similar to the situation uh, found in Caracas. Um, the main action to clean up the Pinedos River, uh, which is the north-south one, uh, is through sanitation service. Uh, they're also doing that on other areas next to the east-west uh, river, the Tite River as well. And since 1986, the municipal government has carried out slum upgrading interventions in 81 slums and is currently working in other 27 communities. In some of those locations, uh, the informal occupation left no space for the installation of the sewage collection and infrastructure. 
And uh, so they create a um, creative solution that uh, is called the quality recovery unit. Uh, these interventions will take place directly in the streams, collecting contaminated water, treating it, and then returning it to the river. Another difference between uh, the Chicago River and Pinheiros River is how isolated the river edge is from the residential or commercial buildings. Uh, the river is separated on both sides by an 11 lane expressway that runs along the entire length. On the east bank, there are also train tracks. There are no street level pedestrian crossings or underground crossings to easily go uh, across the expressway. So the access is very limited to a few bridges and some of them lack proper access for people with disabilities. Along with sanitation works, the cleanup also includes actions to remove garbage floating in the water. They have this uh, huge barges that go around and it's been going on for years. So for several years, state and municipal government have been promoting the beautification and reuse of the river edges. In 2010, the first portion of the Pinedos River bikeway was finished and uh, uh, on a repurposed maintenance path from the State Water and Energy Company on the East Bank. In 2019, the state government launched the new Pinedos River program. The program is an initiative to better integrate the river with the rest of the city and encourage the population to enjoy the riverside. It includes revitalization of the surroundings, including improvements to the bike path with the new user uh, supporting areas, vendors, and space for events as well. The new Pinedos River uh, program will also expand on another program called the Urban Orchard Pro Project that started in 1999. The project's objective is to return native vegetation to the riverbanks. It not only improves the look and feel of the area, but it also aims at environmental recovery. Along with water cleanup efforts, it has already helped bring back wildlife to the river. Implementation was done through partnerships with private companies. The other piece of the new Pinedos River project is the creation of a new linear park uh, called Bruno Carvos Park on the west bank of the Pinedos River. So that's the other bank. The one where the back path is, is on the um, east bank. And now there is this new one on the other side of the river. Uh, work already began in 2021 and will include walking paths, bikeway, sport courts, skate park, cultural and leisure facilities, food and beverage vendors, restroom, first aid assistance stations, and many other uh, facilities. Uh, new access will interconnect the area with public transit. And even uh, a floating walkway across the river is planned to connect the two bikeways and the two, um, the two areas, the two linear parks. Like in Chicago, bringing more people to the water's edge helps create a connection between the residents and the river. Uh, we think that improving awareness about the river and the recovery efforts create public support for important uh, initiatives as well. And it can help, also help educate the population resulting in reduced litter dumping into the waterways. Ultimately, it promotes economic growth, as Ernie was saying. Uh, there is a lot of there are a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for businesses. It could be tourism, it could be the vendors, and there are other uh, things that could promote economic growth to the entire city. And with this, we ended our presentation, and we're open to answer any questions. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias por esta charla tan interesante y tan inspiradora como estudiante motiva ver este tipo de proyectos donde el río es protagonista. Y bueno, ahorita queríamos invitar a todo el público a que realice sus preguntas por micrófono o también puede irlas escribiendo por el chat. Este... Yo quisiera comenzar con la mía este, preguntando qué aspectos de la ciudad han servido de inspiración para la creación de estas propuestas, tanto en el caso de Chicago como en el caso de Sao Paulo. Ok, thank you, María Valentina, por um, interjecting. She congratulates you both on such an inspiring approach um, to the practice and then both the Chicago River and the Sao Paulo example. Uh, to learn from, and she has invited everybody to pose questions, but poses the very first one herself, which is uh, what aspects inherent to the city of Chicago, and we could extrapolate to Sao Paulo as well, have been the core that inspires the proposal. So like aspects of the city itself that generate 
um, the proposal. Um, for the city of Chicago, the, the uh, inspiration of the impetus for, for doing this actually uh, came from uh, the leadership. You know, the, the mayor uh, actually was, was the one who saw this as an opportunity. We have 17 miles of lakefront, which people populate all the time, but it is, that is the prime uh, real estate. And so in a lot of ways that separates a lot of the neighborhoods from being able to get to the lakefront. So the river really became another opportunity uh, for uh, communities to engage with the water system, which uh, could be beautiful if you cleaned it up. So that was, uh, I think, the, the uh, impetus for, for getting that done. Okay. Um... Sí, que lo que eh, señala es que este proyecto nace de liderazgo de la alcaldía, que lo vio como una oportunidad. Nos recuerda que son 17 millas, que más, más o menos son 25 kilómetros de frente que tiene la ciudad sobre el río, y que en realidad a, habían separado urbanizaciones o vecindades. Entonces, eh, rápidamente se entendió que el río era una oportunidad para acercar y para cohesionar mejor la ciudad, pero como una eh, frente al sistema del agua. Eh, entonces, eh, no sé si Barbara. Joana quieres añadir algo. Ah, uh, well, I was not involved in the projects in São Paulo. I just wanted to bring that as an example uh, for you with the Latin American. But uh, what I did research, and I mean, it's it is a familiar project to me because you know I grew up over there, uh, and I saw it becoming a reality. Uh, I think that the main difference between um, here in in Chicago and what happened in São Paulo is, um, I think that. The, the river was not polluted that long ago. So there are people who are still living, like, you know, my grandparents' generation, they used to swim and they, there were um, sports competition in the river uh, not very long ago, you know, like maybe 15, 50 years ago or so. So I think that that memory is still fresh in people's mind. So there was both a uh, situation where the government, uh, you know, the city's leadership and mayors and, and the state government as well uh, played an important role launching all those uh, initiatives, but there was also um, popular pressure to, to get it done and conservation groups, uh, grassroots groups, uh, putting some pressure to clean up the river. And once it started, you know, getting clean, that was, as I said, over 30 years ago, with the improvements, it's not even close for us to be kayaking in the river, but um, I think that you can start promoting some other uses on the banks. It's not directly in the water, but it's close by. And I think that one thing leads to the next. And that's uh, the, the new initiatives that come back uh, with improving the quality of the space next to the river and bringing more and more people too. Okay. And if the Joana señala que en el caso de Sao Paulo ella los comparte el proyecto, aunque no ha estado directamente involucrada en ella, pero que aunque sí hay eh, una presión que viene desde eh, el gobierno, ella señala que la presión importante ha venido del sector privado, de la sociedad civil y de activistas ambientales eh, demandando la recuperación. Ya van 30 años, ella dice no se puede todavía uno zumbar al río en kayak, pero que otros usos menos, eh, vamos a decir, menos peligrosos en ese sentido, sí se pueden ir contemplando y poco a poco acercar a las personas e incrementar la demanda por su saneamiento, vamos a decir, total. Eh, podemos entonces quizás avanzar con algunas otras preguntas. Eh. Yo quería hacer una pregunta este, sobre los actores involucrados en estos proyectos, porque... Obviamente está su rol como diseñadores, y, pero ¿de dónde nace la iniciativa en términos de eso? ¿Es siempre un agente privado el que dice, bueno, tengo esta parcela, vamos a desarrollar este frente del río? 
o hay una iniciativa pública eh, que articule todas estas iniciativas, también en la parte de mantenimiento del espacio y de, y de la ejecución. ¿Es siempre pública o, o es privado? ¿Hay una combinación? Me gustaría saber. ¿Y de qué manera la comunidad participa? Ok, so uh, Alejandro's question has to do with the actors involved uh, at writ large uh, and how the first initial stages are. We're, we're very keen on the initial stages, as you can tell, because that's where we hope to be in, in our own process. And so granted, uh, you mentioned, Ernie, how important the, the mayor's role in, in, in getting the project going, but like how were the in each segment, how were they defined and how and kind of funded also in terms of uh, getting the project started? It was it public, private, or combinations? Not just the funds, but the actors involved. And um, he's also asking about the maintenance afterwards. How is the maintenance um, managed in terms of you know who who is responsible, but also the funding, I suppose, and then. Final part of the question, so it's like many parts, is how to encourage and engage the, the participation of communities. Thank you. That, that actually is a very, very good question. Um, one of the things I, I would say, it's not only, you can't only do it with a single party. And I mentioned it was the, the impetus of the mayor to, to initiate this. But there were also grassroots uh, uh, activities. Um, Joanna had mentioned the Friends of the Chicago River, which mm -hmm. is an uh, advocacy group at the ground level that had always been talking about, oh, we need to clean the river, we need to clean the river. But, 1979, I think she mentioned. Yeah, 1979, exactly. And so one of the, when, when you have this top and bottom uh, and you start to continuously talk about it, you start to engage more and more people into this. But there are a lot of communities adjacent to the river that were really affected by this and this saw this opportunity. Uh, so the funding, the initial funding really came from kind of federal money. Uh, you know, the United States now has this infrastructure bill that is passing. So that always, that kind of filters down to the states and then to the cities. So in order to get a lot of this uh, money, you know, you have to put in the grant, uh, you have to propose it and, and apply for the grants. And that's how they, they ended up getting this, this initial money. Um, and so, you know, the small successes, I told you that, for instance, Pingtown Park was a 20 year project, 20, 25 year project. And we did it a piece at a time. And so what, you know, once you saw the success, they said, this is amazing, and what can this do to this community? We need to continue to expand that. And that's how that, that evolved. The maintenance is uh, it, by a variety of different people. Uh, but a lot of times, the Friends of the Chicago River is really the watchdog in making sure that that does happen. OK, no, fantastic. Um... Señala que no es realmente, o sea, aunque dijo que era el alcalde, sí involucra a muchas personas y un ente clave fue esta. Grassroots es una palabra fantástica en inglés que no tenía traducción al español, pero quiere decir que viene desde abajo, viene desde la gente, ¿no? Eh, Friends of Chicago River es una organización de 1979 e empezaron a abrir esta conversación, a hacer mucha presión, pero las vecindades adyacentes al río que estaban afectadas por él, me imagino que por mal olor, por el riesgo que podía, se agarraron de esa iniciativa y le dieron más, eh, más aliento, vamos a decir. Este, en cuanto a los fondos, ellos aplicaron como ciudad mediante subvenciones, que se llaman grants en, español, en inglés, al gobierno federal que tiene un rubro para infraestructura y eso baja al Estado y eventualmente a la ciudad, pero me imagino con mucha paciencia. Pintown Park es un proyecto de 20 años en el que ha estado involucrado y lo hicieron por fases y por pedacitos. Cada pedacito incrementaba el entusiasmo y se abrían más posibilidades para continuar. El mantenimiento es manejado por varias compañías o varios entes, pero este... Eh, 
este Friends of the Chicago River, amigos del río Chicago, son los que supervisan todas esas actividades. Entonces, se ha convertido en una, un ente súper clave en, en el funcionamiento de todo esto. Um, if I may ask, this, how does the Friends of the Chicago River get their financing? Um, they get their funding through not only other grants and foundations, mm -hmm. but also through um, private donations. There are a lot of, their board is very active, active. And, and very well connected to a lot of the business leaders uh, throughout Chicago. So when you start to look at um, their board and who, how influential they are, they get a lot of money I mean, from uh, yeah. any, you know, numerous businesses and numerous uh, philanthropists. So that's great. Ah, uh, no, perdona que me introduce, introduje yo una pregunta, pero me da curiosidad cómo esta ONG, los amigos del Chicago River, conseguían su financiamiento y es que es por donaciones privadas, pero han logrado tener una junta de directores muy influyente en Chicago que logra movilizar los fondos. Es la metodología en los Estados Unidos, por excelencia. Eh, ¿Alguna otra pregunta que quieran hacer? Hay una también. Hay una pregunta en el chat, sí. Si quieres leerla. Vale. Eh, María Teresa nos va a presentar. Buenas tardes, gracias por las presentaciones. En ambos casos, Chicago y Brasil, las aguas parecen tranquilas y parecieron tener un volumen constante. ¿Han tratado el cauce de los ríos para controlar la afluencia de agua? En Caracas, el volumen del río Guaire es variable y en ocasiones con las lluvias se desborda inundando zonas residenciales próximas, como la, la organización La California. Gracias. Uh, this question comes from Maria Teresa Novoa. Um, in both cases, Chicago and uh, Sao Paulo, the water, at least in the photograph, seems to be quite tranquil and the volume seems to be constant. So have you... Uh, encountered rivers whose volume uh, needs to be controlled or, um, and the questions because in Caracas, the volume of the uh, Guayda River is very uh, variable with rains and um, at some points can be a very small sort of uh, small river, but can also flood to the point of affecting residential areas and the surrounding, she mentions a couple, but. Um, for, for, and Joanna, you can probably talk a little bit more about San Paulo, but the, um, Chicago river, the current variation is not very, it does not vary that much. So it is a very slow moving river. Most of the time during large rain events, it gets, uh, the current gets, uh, bigger, but it, it is, uh, primarily pretty steady. Um, we have started to look at other rivers around the United States uh, and, and starting to do other projects that have a larger volume in, of current. Um, and so, yes, that, that de definitely becomes an issue in how, how you're treating that edge. So uh, a lot of the examples that I showed you were this very natural edge. Um, some, uh, if you have a a uh, high current that usually is not the best uh, treatment. So, but we deal with the uh, currents and different variety of water along the lakefront. So we understand how, how that can be affected, you know, how that can affect um, how you're designing these. Sí, está super interesante que ellos Um, en Chicago no encuentran esa variación en los niveles del agua, es bastante constante. Um, están empezando a tener proyectos en otros ríos donde sí ven eh, cambios y lo evidente es que cómo se trata el borde es más complejo, o sea, esa, ese borde natural eh, verde que nos mostraron en muchos casos con el río Chicago ya no es posible, ¿no? se tiene que contemplar algo más variable, pero eh, señala que el lago de Chicago sí tiene esas fluctuaciones de nivel, eh, entonces es una, el, el borde del río de Chicago es o bien eh, concreto o, o playa, interesante la, la comparación. Eh, no sé si Joana quieres comentar algo más. 
Uh, yes, I, the other thing that I was going to add is that both Chicago and also the Pinedos River, they were um, changed by men, right? Uh, the course uh, of the, the Chicago River changed, and in the Pinedos River, they did that as well. They reversed the course uh, to uh, pump water into the reservoir that is, you know, the, it's upstream. And uh, so that is another way that they are able to control the level of the water as well. And I think that in Chicago, they can do that as well. But the river um, is in a different level. Uh, the, the water level on the river is different than the water level on the lake you know, in Chicago. And you, knew, uh, you probably know what the Eclusa are. You know, when, when you want to navigate, you need to, you have the, the two barriers and you change the water level. So I think that that is another way that they control the level when there are heavy rains. And uh, in Sao Paulo that happens as well. Uh, the natural course of the river was to flow towards the towards north, the Tietê River uh, that, that I showed on the map. And uh, about, I can remember, I think it was like on the 1950s or so, they dammed and they re reversed the river. Um, so now they, they also control that level, but um, flood is uh, pretty much a big issue in Sao Paulo as well. The, the summer rain, the torrential rain that we get over there, there are several times of the year when the, uh, the, the adjacent uh, roads will, will flood as well. Sí, que este, ambos ríos han tenido unas intervenciones mediante esclusas que son parte del control del nivel del agua. Es decir, en el caso del río Chicago, el nivel del río y el nivel del lago donde ella eh, desemboca no son iguales. Y si hay que navegar de una a la otra, hay que hacer el paso eh, paulatino por, por esclusas para atravesarlo. En Sao Paulo, súper interesante... El, el, la dirección del río cambió en el 1900, antes fluía hacia el norte y ahora es al revés, como parte de esta estrategia de, de las esclusas que controlan los niveles y, y a pesar de ello todavía tienen inundaciones en el caso de Sao Paulo, pero bien interesante esa parte, no, creo que nunca se había contemplado para el río Guaire colocar esclusas que controlaran su flujo y... Este, ¿Hay otras preguntas? Sí, este, bueno, aquí Erika Martínez pregunta What elements do you consider to be vital when designing public spaces? Thank you for that question. Um, I did answer that you know public spaces are only good when you have access to them. Mm -hmm. So the uh, you know Joanna had explained the uh, the issue of the river the uh, the river in San Paulo uh, didn't have access to it because of the highway and because of the railroad tracks, and so we also have that difficulty at Ping Tom Park along the river that it's separated from the rest of the community by these railroad tracks. So having those access points were really important to discover, to find out exactly uh, what is the, 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 the best access point to that site was. And then from that point on, how do you do circulation throughout the rest of the park uh, and, and that public space? So those were the two kind of uh, the big pieces. And then when you walk around that space, we were taking you know, various points of, this is the most interesting spot. You know, when we take the photograph of the skyline of the city from that, uh, you know, when we showed you that night shot of the city, it, that's a very important location. So we want to emphasize that location uh, to say, this is a, this is a place of interest. Um, And so those various spots, I think, are very important when you're designing these public spaces. Eh, Ernest señala que los espacios públicos necesitan sobre todo acceso. Importantísimo eh, determinar de qué manera el, pe el peatón puede llegar a ellos para que sea un espacio público exitoso. Y luego también eh, la importancia de tener focos o áreas de mayor interés y bueno, curioso, esto es un comentario que 
no había escuchado con tanta claridad antes como un lugar a donde llegar o varios lugares donde llegar y quizás interrumpir la, lo monótono del espacio. No es siempre todo igual, sino hay un énfasis en algunos lugares. Creo que había una pregunta justo antes de la de Erika. Yeah, uh, the, the question was, has already been answered on the chat. I don't know if we want to go over it. Uh, but the question was uh, about the Friends of Chicago River, if they work as a government group. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, the, the Friends of the Chicago River are, is not a government group. They don't, uh, they actually don't have, um, uh, um, Govern, governing uh, 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 authority over the river itself. But however, they do have advocacy on what happens on the river edges. Uh, so they, they can, you know, uh, if a proposal is done, they will review that to say this is good or this is bad for the community or, um, so they have a lot of uh, influence over it. But the, the river itself is governed like all, every, well, within the United States, every river and every large body of water is actually governed by the United States government. So they have control over everything, which is why if the government decided, if the United States government decided to uh, dam, you know, put a dam up in the Chicago River, they could do that. Uh, and it would be difficult, but. They could do that. La, la respuesta de, de, de Ernie es que no actúan como, lo, los amigos de Chicago River no actúan como un ente gubernamental, sino de supervisión y tienen una voz muy importante, eh, aunque no la competencia per se, esa la tiene el gobierno de los Estados Unidos mediante el cuerpo militar eh, de ingenieros, o sea, es como una parte... Eh, una subsidiaria de, de, de la Armada, y que, este, sin embargo, ellos opinan sobre cómo eh, se gerencia la propuesta de proyectos, la, la, las revisan, son eh, una voz sumamente, con mucho peso, vamos a decir, ante cualquier eh, tema que tiene que ver con el río. Eh, no sé, había yeah. otras preguntas. Uh, I wanted to jump in and make a rather personal question because uh, I had the opportunity to read your letter about architecture in the times of COVID. Uh, I really liked it. And I wanted to know, uh, now that time has went by, what, uh, what do you think is going to be the main impact of uh, COVID on the on public space, on the way we, we relate to public space and we think of public spaces? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, I, you're on mute. <laughs> I said, Alejandro, that's a wonderful question, and and thank you for reading that. I'm 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 humbled <laughs> by that, that you read that. Um, COVID has changed the way we look at the world, um, and particularly in public spaces, we have realized that uh, the outdoors is so much more important to all of us now that we've been trapped inside of our homes, and so. Any opportunity now to be out, be able to uh, be outside, uh, and you know that is the only uh, for a long time for the last two years now. That's been the only way that we could be social, right? And so now, um, you know, I think people have finally realized that these public spaces are are very very important. We have seen an increase in our business, uh, just incredibly. Uh, we are designing more and more public spaces, not only uh, uh, for the city and municipalities, but also developers are also are looking at rooftop, you know, amenity spaces for their tenants. So they're saying they realize that their tenants also want to be out somewhat outside and have that ability to be outside. Uh, so it, I think that it's growing, um, Uh, you know, and we just have to be, you know, make sure that that we can do it successfully 
and with equity, quite frankly. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, that's one of the things that I struggle with is really making sure that people uh, of all backgrounds are able to access public space in a, in a meaningful way. Thank you. Creo que vale la pena traducir, porque es muy bello lo que comenta. Eh, que COVID sin duda ha, ha tenido una transformación, bueno, lo sabemos, sobre la, la vida eh, urbana y que el espacio público en este periodo se volvió el único espacio social posible y se vio la importancia que tenía hasta el punto de que en eh, meses recientes ellos han, han tenido muchísimo más trabajo, eh, más interés en contratarlos, no solamente para espacios públicos por parte de la alcaldía o de, la, o de las ciudades, sino también promotores inmobiliarios los han eh, contactado para eh, introducir espacios abiertos, por ejemplo, en los techos de los edificios, o en cualquier eh, oportunidad para ofrecerles a sus residentes la forma de poder estar afuera. Quizás eso no sería un espacio público, pero sí un espacio abierto, ¿no? Eh, o un espacio semipúblico a nivel residencial. Entonces, eh, eso más o menos fue lo que, lo que ha contado. Joanna, ¿do you want to add to that? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but uh, uh, Joanna actually works with a public, um, you know, she's one of our employees, but she works with a public agency, the Department of Transportation for the city of Chicago. Yeah, I think that you, you hit the sweet spot when you said that everybody now is uh, even more aware of the importance of the public space and um, open space and, you know, being just able to, to have recreational opportunities outside and they're publicly available that you don't necessarily need to pay for a membership uh, of a club or something to, to have that recreational space and especially during COVID in a safe way where you could practice social distance, where you couldn't, uh, you, you could uh, be outside without you know, the paranoia of getting infected in a, in a inside setting. So I think that that's really the, the main uh, lesson that for some of us, it was already very clear, but I think that uh, now the public at large, everybody is thinking about um, how important it is to have that access to public open space. And I think in Chicago, everybody's very fortunate that the, Uh, the lakeside is all public and it's uh you know it, it, it's it's a law that you don't you're not allowed to to build private spaces within a certain distance from from the lake so um i think that that a lot of people value that more and more i'm going to follow up with that joanna mm -hmm. but um you were recently in santiago and what did you observe there during COVID? Um, I, was, uh, I was there during their lockdown uh, in April. Uh, my sister lives in, in Santiago in Chile. And um, I, was, uh, I was happily surprised with how they're using uh, also their public parks and creating uh, new public spaces, like closing off the streets. That happened here in Chicago as well, but over there it was very um, impactful closing a street to allow for outdoor recreational uh, space where maybe there is, you know, if, there, if there's not a park, how can you repurpose uh, what is now a road that it's only used by the cars uh, to allow for people to exercise. And, you know, even if it's a temporary closure, whether it's on the weekend or uh, during uh, selected hours in the morning, So that was something that caught my attention. It was heavily used. And uh, during the lockdown uh, in Chile, that was very severe. They could, uh, you know, people there could only leave the house twice a week. And they needed to have uh, a special permission uh, to leave the house. And, uh, but uh, the, the city allowed people to go out until, I think it was like 9 or 10 a.m. every day to exercise. 
So it was a, a way to promote that kind of important piece of um, not only um, getting exercise done, but also Mira, not being conectó. locked up. Okay, no, uh, I'll try to be swift and get to the main points here. That um, there's uh, what what Joanna set, uh, signaled in the first intervention was the importance of, of a places to recreate, uh, to and be enter entertained. Let's say recreational spaces. Estoy hablando en inglés y tenía que cambiar al español. Que la importancia de espacios para recrearse y que no, no fueran pagados, que, que fueran gratuitos al, al público amplio, se volvió algo mucho más aparente y necesario, pero después eh, Ernie le pidió que hablara sobre la experiencia en Santiago de Chile, que vio durante la visita a su hermana en el mes de abril, y que no solamente era la importancia del espacio público, sino que la calle, que también es pública, pudiese ser reprogramada, fuera durante algunas horas del día o el fin de semana, o quizás en algunos casos llegó a ser permanente, para que la gente pudiese hacer ejercicio o pudiera simplemente estar afuera. ¿no? Eso me parece que ocurrió de distintas maneras en todo el mundo, pero que es eh, importante poder mostrar que la gente es más importante que el coche en la distribución de espacios públicos de la ciudad. ¿no? Eh, If I can continue on that, because Ernie pointed out that I'm uh, also working closely with the Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, now that COVID is getting better, uh, there is uh, almost a huge public pressure to not go back to not having those spaces that in theory were supposed to be temporary at first, right? Like a road closure. Um, if you're in Chicago, some of them could be Uh, just for a weekend, but uh, there were several that were closed where restaurants could put up um, seating outside. And because at some point there was a strict restriction on how many people could be inside at the same time, uh, right? All the, the COVID protocols that we had. So the outdoor area became uh, very important for those businesses to survive. Um, During, during COVID restrictions, especially restaurants. And they put up a lot of tables and chairs outside, outdoors. And uh, now that those restrictions uh, are almost over, uh, people still want that. So people realize that, you know, it's not just a way to deal with COVID. It's something that they, it's an asset. They, they want to use the road or some other types of public space that doesn't necessarily need to be a park. Uh, they, they want to take ownership of that and, and be able to use those spaces in a different way. So the city uh, launched a different program that is not related to COVID that would um, kind of uh, help and incentivize community groups. That Those are not private businesses anymore. So it's not like a restaurant putting up uh, tables outside. This is a community-led effort and community um, application basically uh, to uh, create public spaces and, and activate public spaces in different ways. So each community uh, has been proposing very different things. Uh, some of them would be just painting the sidewalk, but others could be putting up art uh, or uh, creating structures where you could, uh, in a, during an event, Uh, have a stage or have other types of events and a lot of seatings. Um, and, and as I said, it will all be publicly available and maintained by the community. So I think it, that was another thing that came out of COVID is um, a little bit related to how I started saying, how do we use the public space that exists in a different way, uh, but also how it can be uh, used moving forward and how permanent could that be and not just a, a way to deal with COVID restrictions. Joana forma parte desde la oficina de Site Design eh, eh, del, de la administración del transporte público en la ciudad de Chicago y ha visto como medidas que se me implementaron básicamente para la sobrevivencia de algunos negocios que tipo restaurantes o cafés que pudiesen legalmente usar parte de la calle para tener eh, 
lugares donde sentarse afuera, esa iniciativa principalmente la estaba generando el privado, pero que ahora que se han normalizado un poco la estrategia con la cual vamos a vivir con COVID, y el, vamos a decir, es, es el, el, la, la ciudadanía en general no ha querido perder esos espacios que se ganaron, y entonces eh, la ciudad de Chicago lo que ha hecho es lanzar un programa donde están invitando a las comunidades a presentar proyectos de cómo agilizar espacios públicos de distintas maneras, no, no solamente sobre la calle, sino eh, desde sus conocimientos locales, me imagino conocerán ellos mejor que nadie qué oportunidades de crear espacios públicos, entonces se presenta el proyecto a la municipalidad para ser revisada, y imagino eventualmente ojalá implementada, pero eh, parece ser muy eh, dependiente del activismo propio de esa comunidad, que me parece muy bonito. Yo, yo sí siento que el mensaje aquí en general es que logramos entender que la calle, siendo espacio público, sin ningún tipo de resistencia, lo habíamos cedido por completo al coche, y que hemos como que despertado a la conciencia de que no es tan justo que ese lugar tan amplio de la ciudad se ceda con tanta facilidad al coche y tener un poco más de resistencia y pelear por esos espacios para que también puedan ser compartidos con otros eh, es un legado como importante de, de toda esta epidemia. Eh, hay otras preguntas, eh, algunas... Ernie is really good about answering in the chat too. I think you're the first speaker we've had who's uh, been so good at that. Thank you. Sí, bueno, iba a leer aquí otra pregunta que ya mm -hmm. habían respondido, pero bueno, a ver si se quería profundizar más. What social aspects are essential to consider when designing near rivers? And Ernie, if you want to, you've already answered, but if you would like to extend on that. Yeah, I, I, I just, um, we were talking about the COVID restrictions and now we really have to look at that uh, very carefully um, about designing these public spaces near in, in public. So one of the things that we are always considering now is the circulation of people. How do people move back and forth? Um, and whether there have been examples, for instance, in Seattle with the walking trails of going uh, only one way uh, so that there is a circular route uh, of these within these public spaces that you can only go one way. And so you're not coming into uh, um, conflict with somebody else. Um, that's one of the, the, the things. But, you know, having... Uh, creating enough room so that people can gather, but I'll still be socially distanced uh, is, is really important as well. So we, we, we're continuously thinking about that. How do, you, how do you do that? And at the same time, having uh, safety as a, as a big uh, component. Uh, certainly, one of the things that we were criticized at Pingtown Park was that there's no railing at mm -hmm. the river. And... So people said, well, you know, what about our little kids if they, you know, if they fall into the river? And uh, the safety was, was really a big piece there. Um, that park is run by the park district. And they said, who also runs the seven, who also uh, has, um, uh, manages the lakefront. And they said, well, we have 17 miles of lakefront with no rails and people don't you know, oh, only yeah. a few people die. <laughs> so um, you have to be careful and you teach your kids, don't do stupid things. <laughs> so. Yeah. Sí, que, que la, la, la pregunta tenía que ver con eh, qué que aspectos sociales considerar con respecto a el diseño cerca de ríos. Y bueno, una es la seguridad de, de las personas. Por ejemplo, una parte que no escribe en su respuesta es el diseño de eh, vías en un solo sentido, de manera que entonces la gente no se choque, y siempre tratar de eh, proponer la posibilidad de mayor espacio para que 
pueda haber una distancia segura, no solamente desde el punto de vista, eh, eh, vamos a decir, de tránsito, sino también de salud pública, ¿no? Que el, el ejemplo del Pinton Parque, que no tiene reja o baranda sobre el borde, muchos vecinos eh, protestaron eso, eh, pero como para la seguridad de los niños, pero el, el, el intendente de la ciudad de Chicago les manifestó que bueno, aquí el lago tiene 17 millas de frente a la ciudad y en, en la playa más sirve, en el frente al lago no hay, no hay baranda, ¿no? Que, que parte es un poco el juicio de los niños mismos. Eh, hay, hay otra pregunta, pero si me permiten, yo sí quería hacer una yo. Eh, I wanted to ask a question myself or just have you speak to this because I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful aspect of your practices. You have a way of uh, identifying uh, site design as a Chicago-based practice and you guys are very committed to Chicago, um, which I find to be you know, beautiful in the face of so many firms who you really flaunt their, let's say, global or international aspect, but just to be so... Uh, Yeah, committed to a city is uh, something I think worth worth talking about, and also this issue of time and the commitment to projects. For example, Pink Town Park, which is a 20 year project, and and kind of the the participation of the architect in these sites as almost a, a constant friend, a long time friend, right? Um, Chicago is home. Uh, my, my parents were immigrants to Chicago from um, southern China. Um, my father actually had a, had a um, uh, fellowship to come study with Frank Lloyd Wright in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't get his visa out of China that year. And so 1947, he got his visa and was on his way up to Taliesin in Wisconsin to study with Frank Lloyd Wright. But he stopped in Chicago. And he ran into Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, and he never left. <laughs> so, you know, th these are the stories that um, I grew up with, and um, and so Chicago. You know, I I went away for probably about ten years and came back, um, and and really, I'm the only one of the four children who still live in Chicago, mm -hmm. but I do feel that it is my city. And I feel very committed to this community and various commun communities throughout Chicago. Um, uh, the commitment to particularly Chinatown has been very important to me. Um, and, and so it is not only the practice, the landscape architecture practice, but the leadership in Uh, social services and in uh, the commerce of, of that community. And the funny part is that I don't speak Chinese. <laughs> I don't speak Spanish either, but I don't speak Chinese, which is really sad. But, it, you know, it, it's very important to me to be, um, uh, to have that commitment to a, our, a particular place. Um, and I encourage that actually Uh, all over the country, I've been lecturing all over the country, is that no matter what you do, you have to give more of yourself to your own community. And, and I feel very strongly about that. Um, you know, whether, and you, you, the United States is very difficult right now politically, as you, as a lot of people see. And people from different areas. Uh, Sorry about but, that. No problem. But it's a, um, but I encourage people, no matter where you're from, as long as you are engaged in your community, it's very important. But we, I bring that now uh, on our projects across the United States. We have two people who just went down to South Carolina uh, this morning. Um, and my advice to them is always get to know the community. Uh, and, and talk to them, eat their food, eat their, you know, the, the best place to be uh, is the marketplace, right? <laughs> and you see people and you talk, talk to people within those communities, and that's how you get to know them and to be able to feel what they're feeling. And that is 
the source of the best design. Okay. Este, voy a, I'm going to translate because it's, it's a great answer. Um, el, Ernie llega a Chicago como hijo de, de inmigrantes. Eh, la, el, su papá tiene una historia muy interesante que intentó conseguir una visa para venir a los Estados Unidos y trabajar con Frank Lloyd Wright. Y no lo obtuvo el primer año, el siguiente año finalmente lo obtuvo y estaba viajando para llegar hasta Taliesin, donde era la escuela de Frank Lloyd Wright. 1947, am I right? Yes. En, en 1947, y pasa por Chicago y se topó con Miss Vanderbilt y como que se quedó en Chicago. Esa es la historia que le cuentan eh, de sus padres. Bueno, desde ahí, él aunque se fue 10 años, regresó y es el único de cuatro hermanos que sigue teniendo un vínculo tan fuerte con Chicago. Eh, lo, lo, lo comparte completamente, que, que ser parte de, un, de un, una comunidad eh, es, es fundamental, él además participa en este grupo so, eh, de servicios sociales, tiene posiciones de liderazgo, está muy involucrado con el Chinatown de Chicago, aunque eh, dice con un poco de pena que no habla chino, bueno, además que no habla español, eh, pero ese compromiso con un lugar... Eh, lo, lo, lo practica, pero también lo disemina, lo, sale, lo difunde en charlas que da y en la, en la propia oficina. Por ejemplo, tiene a dos personas que se acaban de ir a Carolina del Sur, supongo para un proyecto, y eh, el, el consejo que les da es que realmente hablen con las personas de las comunidades, visiten el mercado, coman la comida local que todo el mundo está comiendo, y se... Y se y, y, y poder así crear vínculos con las personas. Eh, me parece un mensaje como pedagógico para ustedes como estudiantes, súper fuerte. Um, I was just saying that I think that's a really strong message pedagogically for students to uh, kind of leave them with. And, and we're on the hour, so I don't know if there's any last uh, comments or, or, or Joanna or Ernie that you'd like to share. Um, or Joanna, I'll let you go that. first. I, I will, I will have uh, something after you go. Um, no, you should do you. it in Spanish. <laughs> <if you. laughs> I can, I can. Okay. Eh, puedo decirles muchas gracias por invitarnos a esta charla y uh, he podido um, mirar un poco de, del proyecto que están empezando con el río y creo que es una cosa súper importante. Entonces, ojalá en algunos años pueda visitar Caracas y ver ahí alguna cosa que, que se ha hecho con, con eso, el futuro de Río, como yo he intentado um, mostrar con el ejemplo de São Paulo, es que sí es posible hacer de poco a poco y, y, y crear esa, esa relación con, con el Río y, y así eh, eh, continuar con... con el interés uh, público, ¿no? Porque creo que los políticos, si no hay interés de la población en hacer algo, no, no van a hacer, porque para ellos es muy importante eh, ese soporte de, 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 del electorado para los proyectos que hacen, y si no hay soporte del público, entonces puede ser que, que un, una iniciativa que es buena, eh, al, el próximo alcalde, el próximo gobernador no, no va a seguirlo. Entonces, uh, bueno, mucha suerte con el proyecto en el Río Guaire y ojalá pueda visitar ahí un día. I, I just wanted to say I, I'm honored to be here and thank you so much for uh, inviting us to, to present to you. Um, we live in a very small world and the world is changing very, very quickly. And I think it's very important that we all understand that we're all very joined uh, in a lot of ways. And um, no matter where you're from and where you're going, uh, it's important that we remember each other and we remember that um, uh, we all are important. Uh, and, and so I want to just express that, that, that Design is really important to all of us, and the common it is a commonality of all of us as well. Um, so, 
anytime you're in Chicago, please look us up. Uh, we would love to uh, have you and and show you the things that we've done here. Um, and um, we wish you the best of luck. Which is classic. No, thank you for being here. <laughs> I think it's not necessary to translate. I think everybody understood. <laughs> so <laughs> that's fantastic. Este, nada. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Thank you so much. This is You're wonderful. Welcome. Thank okay. you. Okay. See bye -bye. you guys all next week. Bye bye. Take care. Bye -bye.